George Miller's Filthy Frank is the closest thing I think we have to an urban legend on YouTube. On his channel, he would play the aforementioned Frank character and engage in various unsavory skits, rants, and challenges. As with all great works of art, the hands of time show no mercy. And as people move on to, I don't know, content like this, the memory of the Filthy Frank channel and videos has slowly begun to fade. But what many people may be unaware of is that behind the Filthy Frank character and channel, there was an extensive and intricate lore devised by George that served as a narrative backbone throughout all of his online works. Today, I'm going to try my best to summarize the entire Filthy Frank channel lore into a single video, using both the official lore book as well as the shit that was spewed out in the videos on his channel. I've seen a lot of videos compiling all the YouTube content into chronological order, but today I'm gonna go through primarily the book, Francis of the Filth. This is everything. I know you can't remember, but this has everything. How we met, where we're headed. The book was the last thing related to Frank George ever did, so it's the closest thing to a final word we'll ever get. There's a surprising amount of depth and interconnectivity that I wasn't aware of before. Like, according to the law, not all videos were uploaded in chronological order, and some of the videos just don't exist. So it was fun to be a little map pat and try to make everything fit together. You guys, I think I finally solved the filthy Frank law. I also want to emphasize right at the start the importance of differentiating between George Miller and the Frank character. It's no secret that George grew a little tired of people expecting him to act as Frank in public 24-7, so I'll just make it clear I'm approaching this as a work of fiction. I think taking any of this seriously or becoming invested in it at all completely misses the point of the story George was trying to tell. After all, as the first page of the book reads, this book is about a character. It has no relation to the author. For the convenience of the video, I'm going to break everything down into arcs. This isn't in any way an official system of organization, it's just to help simplify things for me and you. And also, this lore is meant to be convoluted and aids by design, so if I get anything wrong, uh, send your threats to this address on screen. And obviously, warning for generic offensive material. Uh, thank you. So, without further ado, let's dive into the full story of Filthy Frank. And that starts with an explanation of the universe this story takes place in. You dig, you dig a multiverse? So, the story of Filthy Frank takes place in a multiverse-esque reality, with near endless different realms, divided by space and time. It's stated that there are three omniverses within each of these countless universes that themselves contain endless dimensions. And within each of these dimensions are millions of individual realms. What's also known is that each different realm has entirely different laws of physics, as well as any number of unique creatures residing within. Likewise, the flow of time seems to differ from realm to realm, as later on we see characters spend a bit of time in one realm only to discover decades have passed in another. Dimensions seem to be named nonsensically, I'm sure somewhere there exists a list of all named dimensions, but like, clearly George was just slamming on his fucking keyboard, so I'm not gonna read into that. So how does one move between realms? Well, it's done via the use of chromosomes. In the context of the story, I'm pretty sure chromosomes are meant to be the DNA meme found inside of humans, and they're also the unit of time, apparently. <laughs> Since one becomes more powerful, the more chromosomes they have, it's not uncommon for powerful entities to pursue weaker beings as to harvest their chromosomes for themselves. The power of all the different entities in the universe is sorted into a convenient tier system known as the Seven Tiers, spanning from the lowest of the low to the supreme being of the universe. The wretched are the lowest tier, beings that exist in a state of only misery and pain, that generally possess no corporeal body and lack consciousness, and they have no hope of escaping their agony. The beasts exist above the wretched, and despite having little free will and existing as slaves, still live in relative comfort comparative to the wretched. The mortal tier consists of regular beings, obviously this includes humans. To the larger omniverse, mortals are something of an enigma, generally being left to themselves as they pose little value for more powerful beings. The rank and files is the tier where most of the Filthy Frank cast exist. These are beings with a significant enough number of chromosomes that they're able to travel between realms, and as a result are on the radar of more powerful beings. Chimpillars is the fifth tier and designated for powerful beings that pursue rank and files across the omniverse to steal their chromosomes. The act of stealing chromosomes is stated to not necessarily be lethal, but more of a severe inconvenience that could potentially lead to fatality. Not all Chimpillars are inherently evil, however, as some are purported to be benevolent. Not much information exists on the sixth and seventh tier, it's unknown if these tiers even exist, or if there are more between them. But these are the tiers stated to belong to the Peace Lords. As with the Chimpillas, not all Peace Lords are good, with some stated to be outright evil. Yo, I heard the Peace Lords are after you or some shit, man. What the fuck you do? The highest tier is for the top god, and the only position that sits objectively on top of all the other tiers. The identity of who occupies this position is unknown, only the knowledge that whoever sits here is the most powerful being currently alive in the multiverse. 
At the very start of the book, we get told the tides of the universe are shifting, in the sense that the universal hierarchy is coming undone as more and more creatures attempt to escape their assigned tier. And it's in this universe of chaos that we find our protagonist. I said Jakarta, I barely know her. <laughs> in the rancid open sewers of Jakarta, an infant is retrieved and given the name Franciscus, meaning freed from the filth. Where the child came from is unknown, however what was quickly apparent is that this child was no spawn of human woman. With its exceptional intellect and instant grasp of speech, this allowed the child to do complex maths on the wall, drawing with his own doo-doo feces. Soon the child was taken to a remote village, where its exceptional abilities quickly led to it being revered more as a god than a child. This genius would not go unnoticed, however, as soon the Indonesian military would come and take the child, with all those who had previously cared for him being gunned down in the process. He was taken to a secretive Indonesian military facility where his genius was nurtured and his sexual desires explored. With his talents soon noticed by the Axis forces, whilst the nature of the deal is unknown, soon after the detonation of the atomic bombs and the surrender of the Axis powers, Franciscus was taken to post-war Japan and placed into custody of the enigmatic Sun Corp, a company that unbeknownst to the world would continue to work in service of the Third Reich. With the big man himself Self allegedly saying with his final breath, Gib al su sun corp. So Frank canonically was at some point officially linked to and supported the efforts of the Third Reich. Now at Sun Corp in Okinawa, Franciscus had his name changed to Frank and was put to work on various weapons of war. During this time, Frank took to singing Christian heavy metal, a habit that utterly destroyed his vocal cords and left him with his signature raspy voice. Within the facility, there was one notable other side character, Ichiro, whom Frank took to calling Bitchiro. Whilst on paper he was captive, within the Sun Corp building, Frank was free to leave whenever he wanted and had the entire top four to himself, free to use all the scientific equipment kept there for his own research and experimentation. His astounding IQ is something not really mentioned in the videos, but in the books it's established that he's meant to be a nihilistic genius. Man, George walked so Justin Roiland could send girls pictures of his n Whilst researching, Frank would come to notice that all of his chromosomes were multiplying rapidly. Remember, chromosomes here are the single most important thing in the universe. Uh, some minor shit happens in the hospital, notably a US general starts to grow suspicious of Suncorp and Frank, that he kills some of the employees. Uh, I thought the evil US general would factor in later somehow, like Frank would fight him towards the end of the book, but, but no, he's just an evil army man who Frank despises and thinks about sometimes. I mean, he's evil in the context of the book, but like, remember, Suncorp employees are literal Nazis. Frank begins to experience vivid nightmares. Nightmares that take the form of numeric sequences. As this goes on for a few months, Frank is basically driven to insanity. He has an autistic breakdown and begins to smash shit in the lab as he screams out the numbers over and over. But by pure accident, one of the broken beakers slits his wrists open, and as he unintentionally laments his broken mind, he draws a circle of blood around himself. What Frank didn't know is that he had just accidentally performed a ritual to travel between realms. Heralded by a thunderous noise, the lab begins to fall apart around him. Bichiro is killed by the process. Well, what a fun character he, he will be missed. Frank is then sent through the portal and finds himself alone on a rock, situated in the middle of a desolate pitch black ocean. He soon realises he's not alone as a pink creature approaches and sits next to him. As you could probably guess, this is Pink Guy, a character beloved by the Frank fandom and integral to the lore. And this interaction is their first canonical meeting. What's most surprising about this interaction is that Pink Guy speaks normal English. He tells Frank that due to his high chromosome count, he has now transitioned from mere mortal into a rank and file like Pink Guy. And so now he's in incredible danger as more powerful beings will be after his chromosomes. Already you can start to see some plot points that are prevalent in the YouTube channel. Frank is told that the ultimate gods still reign supreme, but the peace lords are uniting and recruiting chimpillas to harvest as many chromosomes as possible, making them the de facto rulers of the omniverses. Pink Guy also warns Frank of the dark god Chin Chin, who was after Frank and his abundant chromosomes. Pink Guy, like a twisted Virgil, is here to guide Frank as he runs from the Lord of Darkness. Oh yeah, you wanna know Pink Guy's actual name? It's revealed to be this. Pink Guy opens a portal to a new dimension and him and Frank are sucked into a sea of black infant ooze as they travel to the new realm. Frank awakens in a mangrove-rich jungle described to be similar to the jungles of Okinawa. Here he encounters a lemon man who attacks him, however he's then saved by Salamander Man. Another character fans will know from the channel. Unlike Pink Guy, this is the Salamander Man we all know and love. He plays the recorder and says yes a lot. You know, now that, now that, now that is some funny shit. The two then find Pink Guy as well as Negi Generation 4. The four traverse the swamp for an unstated number of days before coming to a great mountain that they begin to climb, where at the top they're ambushed by Chin Chin, who demonstrates his immense power by immediately beheading and killing Negi Generation 4. Chin Chin gives Frank an ultimatum. 
be doomed to eternal agonizing suffering, or strike a deal, and be returned to his original realm but being required to periodically hand over his regenerated chromosomes. Frank chooses the latter, and him and his companions are sent back to Earth. However, not back to the lab where Frank's journey began. Instead, they're sent to New York. As the group awaken in a New York alleyway, it's soon discovered that Pink Guy, in our realm, can only communicate in senseless grunts. Why is this? I don't know, who the fuck knows or cares? Not me. As they explore, Frank wrecks a feminist and a vegan straw man. Now how, how very 2016. Reaching Times Square, the group begin to make money via photo ops with tourists, and soon they decide to spend their money at a small Japanese restaurant in the city center. Here they meet another classic Frank character, Safari Man. The man, whilst initially unassuming, just looking like a regular Japanese tourist, soon reveals to Frank that he's a rank and file just like them. Offering to help them, Safari Man allows them to stay in his one bedroom apartment. Upon arriving at their new accommodation, Frank finds a video camera and begins to record his inane ramblings as his sanity slowly deteriorates in this dog shit city. I'd like to share with you a little story. Uh, I tend to have explosive diarrhea, like shit just flies all over the place. So I-, I Whilst well, not outright stated, I believe this is meant to imply some of the more basic early Frank videos were filmed during this time. The time they spend in New York is only vaguely mentioned to be a few days, so who knows? Time is a very loose concept in this lore. Millions of years will pass in single chapters, and some time later is used a lot between story beats. Frank could have been in New York for years or days, who knows? Like, I'm trying my best here, okay? It literally says Frank grabbed a camera and recorded his ramblings. That's it. And then the plot just, just moves on. In the book, the story really does move at a breakneck pace. Characters just appear with minimal introduction and then they move around a shit ton. This is where the timeline will start to get a bit fucky. Safari Man reveals the year is currently 2017, meaning Frank has effectively traveled forward in time over 50 years, and means the real world upload date of videos is basically irrelevant. Filthy Frank the Project ended in 2017, so this means everything that came before is either not canon or was uploaded years before it happened in the canon of the show. Fuck you, 2017. We're going rogue. But why is this so fucking confusing? Safari Man introduces the group to illegal crawfish racing, a game in which one can earn both hard cash and chromosomes. To conceal Frank's identity, Safari Man creates the character Kamikaze Failure Frank, where he wears a pilot hat and glasses, and the gang set out into New York ready to win big at the crawfish track. I believe this is where we see the events of the 2015 video Illegal Crawfish Racing. The events of the video are pretty much described verbatim in the book, meaning that this, canonically, is the first video in the series. This is also the first appearance of Alpha Centurion. I'm back, motherfucker! What the fuck did you say, Bobby, man? Despite the character appearing in like 50 videos on the channel earlier. Despite trying to steal all the chromosomes from the event, Alpha Centurion is invited to stay with the group. The character of Drone also comes along with them. Remember Drone? Is, is Drone coming on cold ones? What? With all the chromosomes they've gathered, it would only be a matter of time until Chin Chin came for them. As such, their group set off to find a portal out of New York. They drop into a shit-filled sewer, and we get a graphic description of them being buried in poo-poo. They get sucked under the filth, and are taken to a new realm. We're then introduced to Negi Generation 1, who lives in this new realm populated by thousands of different Negi clans. Some loyal to him, and some mindless and violent. Frank and crew arrive, all drenched in shit, and Pink Guy regains his full faculties once again. It's also worth mentioning the book, Francis of the Filth, in-universe, is supposed to be written by this Negi. However, as they're traveling around, they accidentally wake an endless horde of sleeping Negis, and a gigantic battle commences. Safari Man, in the ultimate act of cowardice, runs into a cave and hides. What follows is an event known as the Great Negi. Negi War, the largest battle in the history of all Negi kind. Even when reinforced with an army of friendly Negis, the scale of slaughter is so immense that Frank realizes he has to try and stop it somehow. Okay, right, this is actually real. Frank grabs a comedically oversized clock and exclaims, it's time to stop single-handedly stopping the entire war. That's right, the green screen meme is actually integral to the law. It's all connected. With the battle over, the group sets out, minus the treacherous safari man, and builds a fire to settle down for the night. However, before they can fall asleep, they're surprised by a nightmarish insectoid chimpilla known as Gitson. Gitson informs Frank that tomorrow he will be given coordinates to a high chromosome realm, so that he can quickly regenerate his chromosomes for Chin Chin. Gitson then just throws the entire remaining cast, save Frank, into a fire, not killing them, but sending them to an unknown location. Frank, scared and alone, falls asleep. The next day, Frank finds the corpse of Negi Generation 1, and the promised coordinates violently carved into his skin. Frank does the usual ritual meme and sets out to the location set by Chin Chin.
Frank awakens in a dumpster, now in the mysterious realm of Godor, a place that looks like a rundown and overgrown Earth city, and it's later explained that this is an abandoned attempt to create Earth by a powerful chimpilla, but now it just sits abandoned. Here, Frank meets Red Dick, another big hitter from the Frank lore. Red Dick seems to be friendly, and he explains how he's going to try to help Frank win back his chromosomes. This time, in an eating contest. The contest is a race to see who can finish a globule of wasabi first. The challenge, oddly reminiscent of a few other videos on the Frank channel. Just like in these videos, we see Prometheus, the muscular masturbation fuel who's described in the book as being immensely powerful, able to knock Frank to the floor with a single slap. In a shocking twist, Frank loses the challenge and is now left with fewer chromosomes than he began with. With Chinchin on the way and without chromosomes, Frank and Red Dick brainstorm how to gather more. Red Dick has the wacky idea of collecting video submissions from fans in some kind of yearly sacrifice. Frank then suggests just stealing blood from children's hospitals and then they do that, I guess. Chin Chin comes for his chromosomes and Frank is drained of all his recently collected power. Chin Chin evidently has further plans for Frank and he etches coordinates on his arm and literally throws him down into the rice fields, the most desolate and remote realm of them all. Waking in the rice fields, Frank says the thing. Welcome to the rice fields, motherfucker! The rice fields are full of countless scary and creepy characters, and Frank wanders for an unknown number of days, surviving off captured insects. When camping, he's found by another big centipede-like chimpilla that just tells him to kill himself. Okay, so in this stage of the book, sort of the last half, it gets very I'm 14 and this is deep. A lot of lengthy exchanges about power and destiny. I'm sure it's ironic and therefore I'm barred from saying it's shit. Frank defeats the centipede and continues on his journey. Eventually, he makes his way to an isolated island where he meets a wise old tree. And the tree just, just shits exposition. Like it's actual just drivel and none of it will matter. We get it, Frank is powerful and the Omniverse is scared of him. Sorry, oh sorry, sorry, it's ironic, sorry. Witty satire, what witty, incredible fucking satire. The biggest revelation here is that Chin Chin is not in fact the ultimate god, just a very powerful peace lord. Hence, he still needs others to feed him his strength and can't rely solely on his own chromosomes, like Frank. The tree tells Frank of a rare technique in which one drains another being of their chromosomes, and Frank peacefully falls asleep beside this enigmatic ally. Frank is awoken by the evil peace lord known as Diu Patera, who cuts down the tree man, killing it and belays a warning to Frank to fear the Peace Lords and remain on the small island until Chin Chin arrives. Frank, who already believes himself to be doomed, defies the Peace Lord's warning and sets out again to try and hide from Chin Chin. When crossing a river, he captures a salmon, and it's here he unlocks the technique described by the tree, giving and taking the chromosomes of the salmon, reviving it and then killing it again. As Frank wanders aimlessly for weeks, he hallucinates the voices of his friends, telling him to carry on. Eventually, he reaches an isolated cabin, and inside is a beautiful Spanish babe. Things get a little bit sexual, and she cares for Frank and begins to beg for sex. Frank, naturally realizing something's up, tries to leave, and it's then the woman transforms into a giant woodlouse-like creature. Frank literally smashes it over the head with a lawn chair and then places his hand upon it and drains its chromosomes until nothing but its exoskeleton remains. This victory, as well as the newly absorbed power, inspire Frank to leave the rice fields and find his friends. He slits his wrists and recites some coordinates and then leaves. Frank awakens in the mountains beside a gentle stream, and after a bit of exploring, finds he's near Fukui, a peaceful, if dull, city in Japan. Should be noted, this may still be a different reality of Earth, as is the New York they spent some time in. Excited to be back home, Frank sets off along the river into town, and beside the water finds a mysterious black egg. As he tries to touch one, he's ambushed by the best fucking character in the entire Filthy Frank lore. All of Percy's dialogue is written like Uncle Remus, so, so, so I'm not gonna quote him at all. Yo, it's Percy the Pigeon, bitch! Ah! Percy the Pigeon? Where my eggs at? I heard he took some of my eggs! Percy reveals his special ability is to shit on people. I wonder if that will come into play later. Well, they say if you're gonna have a pigeon shit on someone in the first half. Oh. Frank then sees an old farmhouse and walks up to greet the elderly couple who reside there. Whilst they don't speak, they provide him with a bed and food. And Frank spends the next few days on their farm, doing some farming shit and gushing about Japanese culture. One day, he accompanies the couple to the market, a crossroads of realms it seems, as many different figures from across the omniverses sell various worldly and otherworldly goods. Frank meets again with Percy, who, despite earlier telling Frank not to eat his eggs, is selling his eggs for profit. Frank continues to explore, and it's at a dusty antique store flogging worthless shit, he finds Salamander Man's iconic recorder. Frank asks the merchant how he came by such an item, and he's told it was purchased from an interdimensional traveller known as Dr. Sack. Fans may recognize Dr. Sack from an old Frank video, Worst Film Ever. This is pathetic. I'm, I'm not so afraid of you, but the, the broccoli, it's, a fright, it's frightening. 
Yeah, he dropped. He dropped his broccoli. He dropped it. Uh, don't worry. You don't need to have seen it. It has no bearing on this Doctor Sack. <laughs> Frank journeys to Doctor Sack's cabin in the woods and meets the schizophrenic explorer. Dr. Sack seems to be utterly demented, schizo posting about Frank and co, but eventually Frank gets him lucid enough to discover how he came about the recorder. It was in fact sold to him by Salamander Man, who was still out there somewhere with the rest of the group searching the omniverses for Frank. Frank, now becoming more powerful than he himself can comprehend, doesn't even need to be told the coordinates of their last known location to figure out where to go. He departs Dr. Sack's house and prepares to set off. But oh no! Dr. Sack has another mental break and begins to shoot at Frank as he tries to leave. Thankfully, Percival the Pidgeotto shits on the Doctor giving Frank enough time to escape. Percy tries to leave with Frank, however knowing the danger, Frank refuses his company. What a character. It's clear to me this was the true vision of the filthy Frank universe. Oh yeah, sorry if it sounds like I'm repeating myself. Every section literally starts with Frank waking up in a new realm. I, I swear that's literally how the thing is written. Here, Frank awakens in a cold and dark realm, knee deep in icy water. The place reminds him of the first realm he ever visited, where he first met Pink Guy. What he sees here are thousands of dying creatures impaled on spikes, left here to suffer half alive for millions of years. This is the eternal punishment for those who defy the Peace Lords, and languish here awaiting eternal damnation. Frank wanders around the dying for an unknown period of time, eventually coming across a dying creature of the same species as Salamander Man. The creature tells him he was cast down here by a Peace Lord, and now the only respite he gets is when Salamander Man visits him once every few million years and plays music to soothe his suffering. The old dying Salamander lifts a weary hand to his nipple and says, yes. We get to learn the extensive backstory of Salamander Man, whose name is actually Seamus. He was Hunted by the Peace Lords, as his musical ability was able to rouse his species to fight the tier system of the Omniverse. Frank realizes if he waits here, eventually Salamander Man may come to him, and so Frank just straight up sits on his ass and waits for a million years. Okay, he doesn't straight up wait, he goes into a weird edgy dream sequence. George likes these waxing brooding paragraphs where Frank describes the feeling of cool water between his toes and the memories of his time in New York. Salamander Man does arrive after a million years and the two finally reunite. Salamander Man reveals all the others have survived and are back in New York. After all this time and all the crazy adventures, Frank is finally going home. Scene transition. Frank is awoken by Chin Chin who has come for his chromosomes. Chin Chin? No. No! Not Chin Chin, no! Frank hands them over, as well as mentioning he collected the chromosomes of all the sacrifices. So if you did make a sacrifice video, congratulations, you get to be canon. Yay! There's no mention of how much time has elapsed since Frank and Salamander Man came to New York, but it can be assumed this is where more Frank content took place. We know for certain this is when all the rat-related videos happened, due to some brief exposition from Alpha Centurion. Okay, this is where the whole chapter sort of just melts on itself. It's implied Frank has been here for some time, but he greets Safari Man as if this is the first time they've met since the Battle of the Neggies. Also, George forgot to delete a draft paragraph, as this one interaction interaction between Frank and Alpha Centurion is just repeated twice in the book. I read this part at like 4am and genuinely thought I was having a stroke. As all of Frank's friends come out of hiding, we discover it's all been a big sting. Frank had hid his chromosomes among his friends to keep them from the Dark Lord. He takes them all back and everyone looks on in awe at the one who's able to deceive the Dark Lord, and may even be able to stand against him. In regards to formal power scaling, we're told throughout his travels Frank moved up from rank and file to the tier of Chimpilla. The gang celebrate their victory, but Frank remains awake, wondering who sits above the system. By now, they're all aware Chin Chin is no true divine being. So who is the one true ultimate god? Following an incident where Alpha Centurion kills a rat and Frank revives it, he takes Salamander Man and Pink Eye back to the second dimension they all visited the one with the Lemon Men and where Negi Generation 4 was killed. Upon finding Negi Generation 4's body, the others debate whether they should bury him. However, Frank refutes their ideas, instead arranging the pieces of his corpse back into a semi-human shape, and then does an iconic Christ resurrection. Uh, he does it by laying directly on top of him, so their mouths are almost touching. Mwah, very erotic. Soon after getting their friend back, the Dark Lord Chin Chin appears on the mountaintop once more, to make Frank pay for such defiance. Frank, however, tells Chin Chin to piss off, and with that, Chin Chin is vanquished. And more importantly, the tears of the universe are changed once more, with a Peace Lord put down by someone who was only a few million years ago, just a mere mortal. The four return home and meet with the others, and celebrate by going for an iconic New York breakfast. Psychics can see the color of time, it's blue. Let's just add a little comma in there. There we go, George. Okay, big new lore drop. At this stage of the story, Frank just learns to fly. He flies now. Ah, truly, this is a book of all time. He flies all the way to Okinawa, and in a small seaside tavern finds all of his friends, as well as Percy the Pigeon. He's back, baby. Percy's back. 
How did he get here? How did they all get here? Don't worry about it, just forget it, okay? They're all drinking and having a good time, but the festivities are suddenly ruined by Diopatera. That's the Peace Lord who cut down the wise old tree in the rice fields. The Peace Lord grabs Pink Guy and with a single utterance is able to seize the others and force them to hear his message and behold his actions. Frank is told to crawl back into the hole whence he came and desist from his goal of overcoming the Peace Lords. And to accentuate his warning, he just straight up cleaves Pink Guy in two. Diopatera leaves, and the others silently take Pink Guy's upper and lower half onto the beach, where they construct a funeral pyre. With Pink Guy gone, the gang are truly at their lowest. What will they ever do? Oh, never mind, he returns on the very next page. They didn't even explain how we survived aside from IBS. Nice. <sighs> it's possible he was saved by Prometheus, who reappears here to metaphorically suck off Frank, as he wants into the friendship group of this rapidly ascending demigod. After the near death of Pink Guy, Frank decides it's in the interests of his friends safety to leave, spend the rest of his days hiding away in the remotest corners of the Omniverse. Frank hides away on a picturesque beach, abandoned and alone. But even here, Chin Chin finds him, and once more, Frank tells him to piss off. Chin Chin tells Frank that thousands of Peace Lords wish death upon Frank and his friends for disrupting the system, and Frank pushes Chin Chin back through the portal whence he came. But Chin Chin drags Frank into a mysterious, jelly-filled world. Below Frank, he sees an unnamed Peace Lord taking the form of an eldritch horror. It grabs him, but before it can squeeze him to death, Frank is saved by Percy the Pigeon. It's return of the King, baby. Percy sacrifices himself for Frank, allowing him to escape. Frank would keep jumping from realm to universe to dimension, eventually finding himself drifting alone in space. In the void, Frank catches a glimpse at a meteor, and who's strapped to the front but Bitchiro? Everyone remember him? Yeah, yeah, that beloved character. What a beautiful payoff. If you have a Bitchiro in the first act, uh... One by one, more Peace Lords appear, until Frank is completely surrounded. As Frank realizes how fucked he is, he thinks back to Okinawa, questioning if he would have been happier just staying a mortal. Insignificant, but blissfully ignorant. However, in an instant, all the Peace Lords are turned to stone. That's concrete, baby. As Frank looks around, he sees a light, and upon meeting with it, asks it a single question. Are you God? The light replies simply, Yes. Frank asks to be shunned, as a man so filthy as himself is unworthy to be in the presence of God. But God bestows Francis with a litany of divine gifts, and dubs him Francis of the Filth. He presents him with a divine task, to go to the filthiest places on earth, and appeal to the lowest common denominator. To do what? I, I don't know, is he fucking Jesus Christ or some shit, maybe? Is this a Jesus meme? Frank is then teleported back to the New York apartment. Inside we see the whole cast, including Percy the Pigeon, who survived. I'm glad they killed him off for three pages. Uh, it's a whole Return of the King ending. Everyone just laughs and hugs. When they ask Francis how he stopped the Peace Lords, Frank takes credit for the whole turning to stone meme. And as the novel ends, he wonders if the god he met is even the ultimate being. Does it just want him on side so Frank doesn't think to question it as well someday? Who knows, but what an epic and wholesome ending. The gang will go off to do some wacky side quests, and Frank ends things off by thinking he is finally the god of his own reality. Council of Nicaea, eat your heart out, baby. Is Chin Chin still alive? Does this take place after any of the videos got put on the channel? But you're telling me Joji has something to do with this? Man oh man, what a story. Of all the books I've read, that this was one of them. As I mentioned earlier, you can only take this book so seriously. It only takes itself so seriously. And if you think about what it was trying to do, it was attempting to stitch together a solid continuity from a bunch of videos that quite honestly had no larger story in mind when they were made. The main issue I had is that it just doesn't really work in the continuity of the channel. Also, I guess this sadly means all the Cancer Crew slash Shrimps and Boys activities are sadly non-canon. I'm, I'm devastated. I guess I was just expecting something more akin to those Naruto filthy Frank anime memes. Remember this? Oh man. But what the fuck? The announcement video for the book doesn't fit in the law anywhere. Why the fuck would you make a law bible for your internet show and then just fucking throw everything out the window? Why jo- Okay, hold on. Let's let's conclude this somehow. Uh, I don't know of any other YouTube channel that would have even attempted what George did. To try and create a fictional world and narrative for your YouTube project, and then have the dedication to pen an entire novel just so the story you made could have something resembling a conclusion. George could have left the story unfinished and just dipped to do his music, but he cared enough about his fans that he wanted to give them some kind of closure. And I guess that's what the book is really. Just a big love letter from George to his fans. A massive, unfunny in-joke. That's just a theory. Again. <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed. This was uh, this was actually quite fun to research and all put together. So uh, so I hope you liked it. Uh, I know things have been a bit slow recently, but that's just because with life in general, uh, 2024 is going to be a big year. I, I I got some big things planned. Dare I say, fuck you, 2024. We're going rogue.